Welcome back to The Book of Mormon, a masterclass. My name is John Hilton. Have you ever seen one of those pictures where, depending on how you look at it, you see a different image? There is a picture like this, and depending on which way you look at it, you either see a duck or a rabbit. There's another one where you either see an apple core or two people staring at each other. One of my favorite images like this has a man playing a saxophone if you look at it one way, or it's the silhouette of a woman if you see it in a different way. These kinds of pictures give us an illustration that depending on how you look at something, you'll see it differently. For me, this is a really great object lesson when it comes to the chapters in the Book of Mormon. When Joseph Smith was translating the Book of Mormon, he saw something that caused him to designate chapter breaks in the Book of Mormon. But the chapter breaks that we have today are different than the original chapter breaks. Today, Jacob has seven chapters, but in the original book of Jacob, there were only five chapters. What we have is Jacob two and three were one chapter, and what we have is Jacob four and five were another chapter. This has caused me to see the book of Jacob differently. In the past, when I was teaching the book of Jacob, I would usually teach Jacob one through four in one class, and then Jacob five through seven in another class. But once I realized that Jacob 4 and 5 were one continuous chapter in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, I realized that I didn't want to interrupt Jacob's train of thought. In fact, there's a really great insight that I'm excited to share with you later today that we can see once we realize that Jacob 4 and 5 are one continuous text. But let's start out at the beginning of Jacob chapter 4. As he's wrapped up Jacob chapter 3, Jacob tells us a hundredth part of the proceedings of this people, which now began to be numerous, cannot be written upon these plates. Jacob's telling us that he can only include a very small portion of the things that he could share with us. So that means that whatever he is sharing is really important. And it's clear that Jacob's focus is on Jesus Christ. He writes, For this intent have we written these things, that they may know that we knew of Christ. We had a hope of his glory many hundreds of years before his coming. And also all the holy prophets which were before us believed in Christ and worshiped the Father in his name. Consider that 100% of all of the prophets, Jacob said, knew of Jesus Christ and testified of him. Jacob explains, for this intent, we keep the law of Moses, it pointing our souls to him. He also explains that Abraham sacrificed Isaac in similitude of God and his only begotten son. Jacob makes it really clear that prophets like Moses and Abraham knew of Jesus Christ and their works were foreshadowing his. Jacob goes on to write, Be reconciled unto God through the atonement of Christ, his only begotten son, and obtain a resurrection according to the power of resurrection which is in Christ. Jacob then asks us a question that I hope we will really ponder. He asks, why not speak of the atonement of Christ and attain to a perfect knowledge of him? Think about that question. Jacob is urging us, why not obtain a perfect knowledge of Jesus Christ? Or we might say in the words of President Russell M. Nelson, learn all you can about Jesus Christ. Why is it so important for us to learn all we can about Jesus Christ? President Nelson explained, whatever questions or problems you have, the answer is always Jesus Christ. I think just like for the Nephites, their focus on the law of Moses pointed them to Christ. It can be the same thing in our lives with the different devotional acts that we do. I love, for example, what my colleague Josh Sears said. What if instead of talking about scripture study, we talked about Christ study? I love switching my mindset from I'm studying the scriptures to I'm studying Jesus Christ. I'm focused on him. President Russell M. Nelson said, as we invest time in learning about the Savior and his atoning sacrifice, we are drawn to him. As we seek to be disciples of Jesus Christ, our efforts to hear him need to be ever more intentional. It takes conscious and consistent effort to fill our daily lives with his words, his teachings, his truths. 
Think about some of those words. We need to invest time learning about Christ. Our efforts to hear Him need to be ever more intentional. And it's going to take conscious, consistent effort to fill our lives with His words. How can we go about doing this? There are lots of approaches, and I just want to share with you some of my favorite ways of learning all I can about Jesus Christ. First is what I like to think of as the topical guide invitation from President Russell M. Nelson. President Nelson said, During the January 2017 Worldwide Devotional for Young Adults, I challenge those watching to increase their testimony of the Savior by taking time each week to study every scriptural citation about Jesus Christ in the topical guide. That's more than 2,200 verses across 57 subtitles. President Nelson continues, I promised those listening that if they would proceed to learn all they can about Jesus Christ, their love for Him and for God's laws would grow beyond what they could currently imagine. What I didn't mention during this address was that I knew this promise was true because I was in the midst of completing this very same assignment myself for the first time. On President Nelson's blog post, where he talked about this invitation, you can see he's printed out all of the pages from the topical guide and put little check marks as he reads through it. President Nelson continues, On December 1st, 2016, I obtained a new set of scriptures and proceeded to begin the same assignment that I would later extend to young adults in January. When I finished the assignment six weeks later, I had looked up and marked more than 2,200 citations from the four books of scripture. When I finished that exciting exercise, my wife asked me what impact it had on me. I told her, I am a different man. Now think about that. President Nelson was in his 90s. He had been an apostle for decades. But carefully studying every reference to Jesus Christ in the topical guide had a huge influence on him and, in his own words, made him a different man. President Nelson continues, for me, to be able to accomplish this assignment was just thrilling. I have devoted much of my 92 years to learning about the Savior, but rare are the occasions when I have been able to learn as much as I did over this six-week study period. Now, I realize some of you are probably thinking to yourselves that you couldn't possibly have time to complete an assignment like this. I know how you feel. I thought the same thing of myself, that there's no way I can have time to do all of this. I needed to remind myself that a faith-promoted comment would be, I know I don't have time for this, but I'm going to make time for it, and I'll fulfill it with what time I have. President Nelson concluded, To those of you who feel you don't have time, if you will make a sacrifice, you will be well rewarded and very, very grateful for the change of perspective, increased knowledge, and improved depth of your conversion. I know this is true because I have seen the same rewards in my own life. I promise you that if you will study His words, your ability to be more like Him will increase. I know this is true. If you're interested in exploring more about President Nelson's invitation to study all of the references to Jesus Christ in the topical guide, there's lots of resources available online. You could just Google President Nelson topical guide invitation. Think about this invitation and connect it with Jacob's question. Why not speak of the atonement of Christ and attain to a perfect knowledge of Him? Of course, there are many other ways that we can focus our studies on Jesus Christ and learn more about Him. Seriously studying the Book of Mormon is one of the greatest approaches. I love Elder Neil L. Anderson's invitation. He said, I think it is very helpful if you begin today to learn a few of the teachings of Jesus Christ and have them in your memory. Choose your own passages to memorize. Find some things that Jesus has said and let them penetrate who you are. Of course, there are also many books that we could read about Jesus Christ, some written by members of the church and many that are not written by members of the church. I have learned so much from studying scholarship about Jesus Christ. Now, I know what some of you are thinking to yourselves, wow, Brother Hilton, read all of the verses about Jesus Christ in the Topical Guide, seriously study the Book of Mormon, memorize scriptures, read other books. Couldn't I just watch a movie or something like that? 
Of course, there are so many wonderful movies to watch about Jesus Christ. There is music that we can listen to. And there's also a little object lesson that I sometimes like to do with my students. I'll put up on the screen an image of Reese's peanut butter cups, and you can start to watch students' mouths watering. And I'll say something like, how many of you are thinking about Reese's peanut butter cups right now? And nearly everybody is. I'll say, how many of you were thinking about Reese's peanut butter cups five minutes ago? And usually there's one or two people that were. The point of this object lesson is to highlight that what we see affects us. So maybe one way we could work towards obtaining a perfect knowledge of Jesus Christ is to have more Christ-centered artwork up in our homes. For those of you who might be interested, I actually have a masterclass that's focused on Jesus Christ. It's called Seeking Jesus, and it's freely available online. Whatever approach you and I choose to use, I hope we'll carefully consider Jacob's question. Why not speak of the atonement of Christ and attain to a perfect knowledge of Him? Or, as President Russell M. Nelson invited, learn all you can about Jesus Christ. So far in Jacob chapter 4, we've seen that Jacob is very focused on the Savior. As we come to the end of what we have today is Jacob chapter 4, but remember this is just a continuing thought, he brings up an interesting point. Jacob writes, according to the scriptures, remember that phrase, this stone shall become the great and the last and the only sure foundation upon which the Jews can build. And now, my beloved, how is it possible that these, after having rejected the sure foundation, can ever build upon it? that it may become the head of their corner. Now notice that Jacob is clearly alluding to some verse of scripture here, and it appears that he's thinking of Psalm chapter 118, which says, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Peter will reference this verse in the book of Acts as he's teaching the people. He says, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. So in other words, Jacob is saying something like, Jesus Christ is the only sure foundation. So once the Jews reject this foundation, how are they ever going to build upon it? And his answer to that question is found in the allegory of the olive tree. That's the connecting point between Jacob chapters 4 and 5. It's not that there's just a whole separate story about olive trees that Jacob wants to tell us. The allegory of the olive tree is central to how the people will build upon Jesus Christ. Now, when it comes to the allegory of the olive tree, there is lots that we could talk about. Did you know that there is a book more than 600 pages long? This is longer than the entire Book of Mormon that is just dedicated to the allegory of the olive tree. Chapter 21 of this book is called Botanical Aspects of Olive Culture Relevant to Jacob, Chapter 5. In this chapter, the authors point out that Joseph Smith grew up in an environment where olive trees weren't cultivated, so he didn't know anything about horticultural practices related to olive trees. What they wanted to find out is, are the practices described in Jacob 5 accurate according to ancient horticultural practices related to olive trees? And definitely do not base your testimony of the Book of Mormon on this detail, but they are. And I think that's really cool. That's a detail that Joseph Smith wouldn't have been able to make up. Now, I know what some of you are thinking to yourselves. Wow, a 600-page book on Jacob chapter 5. I wish I could read it for free online. Wish granted. I've gone ahead and linked to it on the course website for you. We won't be able to cover all 600 pages about the allegory of the olive tree, but there are some interesting things for us to explore. Let's begin with a basic overview of this allegory. This is a story about an olive vineyard, which represents the world. There's a tame olive tree representing the house of Israel and wild olive trees, which represent Gentiles or parts of Israel that have fallen into sin. There are two main characters, the Lord of the vineyard, who could represent Jesus Christ, and a servant, who we might see as the Lord's prophet. At the beginning of the allegory, the Lord of the vineyard is distressed because a tame olive tree has started decaying. Despite his attempts, he can't revive it, so he comes up with a plan. He will burn the dead branches and move the living branches from the tame olive tree to three wild olive trees in distant parts of the vineyard. He will also take some branches from a wild olive tree 
and graft them into the tame olive tree. This represents the scattering of Israel. Sometime later, the Lord of the vineyard and his servant return. They find that the tame olive tree is now producing good fruit. The first two wild trees that had branches from the tame olive tree grafted in are also producing good fruit. The third tree is producing some good fruit and some bad fruit. Perhaps we see in the third tree a representation of the Nephites and Lamanites. They were a branch broken off from Israel, the tame olive tree, planted in a good spot of ground, but only part of the tree is bringing forth good fruit. The Lord of the vineyard wants to burn all of the bad branches, but the servant says, spare it a little longer. So some time passes, and the Lord of the vineyard and the servant return again to the vineyard. Unfortunately, now the tame olive tree and all three of the other trees are now producing only bad fruit. We could see this as a time of universal apostasy from the fullness of the gospel. The Lord of the vineyard's heart is broken. He decides to destroy the trees, but the servant persuades him to give the trees a little more time. The Lord of the vineyard then outlines a new plan. The original branches from the tame tree will be returned to it, and the wild branches currently in the tame tree will be moved to the distant trees. This could represent the gathering of Israel. The allegory concludes with the servant recruiting other helpers, and together they execute the new plan working side by side with the Lord of the vineyard. Eventually, all the trees begin producing good fruit. The Lord of the vineyard congratulates the workers and tells them he will harvest the good fruit, and that when the vineyard begins to produce bad fruit again, he will burn the vineyard. So that's the overarching storyline of Jacob chapter 5. But let's look at it in connection with Jacob chapter 4. The whole purpose of Jacob chapter 4 is to tell us that we need Jesus Christ. That should remind us that in the allegory of the olive tree, what we're talking about is not trees, and we're not even talking about moving groups of people from one place to another. This is about bringing people to Christ. I love this observation from Dr. Robert Millett. He said, an overriding message found throughout the Book of Mormon is that people are gathered not just to a place, but to a person, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this pattern throughout the Book of Mormon. Nephi writes, The natural branches of the olive tree or the remnants of the house of Israel should be grafted in or come to the knowledge of the true Messiah. Jacob also wrote, Thus saith the Lord God, when the day cometh that they shall believe in me, that I am Christ, then they shall be restored unto the lands of their inheritance. In Jacob chapter 5, we see how personal the labors of the Lord in the vineyard are to him. This is about us connecting with Jesus Christ. Look at a few of these examples in aggregate. The Lord says, my vineyard more than 30 times. We are His. The phrase, lay up the fruit thereof unto mine own self, appears 20 times, in addition to several other instances about preserving unto Himself the fruit. If we think of ourselves for a moment as the fruit that's being produced, Jesus wants to gather us to Him. That's the gathering that we're talking about in Jacob chapter 5. We also see in this chapter the tender love Jesus has for each of us. We read, The Lord of the vineyard wept. Can you feel the tender love Jesus Christ has for me and for you? Consider some other phrases that are repeated in this allegory. The Lord says eight times, It grieveth me that I should lose this tree. He says on multiple occasions, What could I have done more for my vineyard? And he says, I have done all. Can you feel in Jesus Christ, his love for each of us, his outreach? He's doing everything he possibly can to help us come to him. And it grieves him if we don't. Now, the Lord has some strategies for cultivating his vineyard. We see these over and over again. Phrases like nourishing the tree, digging around it, pruning it, and fertilizing or dunging it. Now, if we were to maybe liken these to ourselves, we might think of nourishing as blessings that we receive. 
pruning as taking something out of our lives, digging about, maybe preparing us for something, and dunging that could be trials that really stink. All of us have experienced these actions of the Lord in our own lives. I want us to consider one of them, the pruning. Have you ever felt Jesus Christ pruning anything out of you in your life? There's a story told by President Hubie Brown in his famous talk, God is the Gardener. If you recall, President Brown talks about trimming one of his currant bushes that was growing too large. As he did, he imagined that he could hear the currant bush say to him, How could you do this to me? I was making such wonderful growth, and now you have cut me down. I thought you were the gardener here. He said back to the bush, I am the gardener here, and I know what I want you to be. I didn't intend you to be a fruit tree or a shade tree. I want you to be a currant bush. And someday, little currant bush, when you are laden with fruit, you are going to say, Thank you, Mr. Gardener, for loving me enough to cut me down. Later in his life, President Brown was passed over for a promotion that he desperately wanted because he was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This was devastating to him. He says, I had a broken heart and bitterness in my soul. I clenched my fist and I shook them at heaven. I said, how could you do this to me, God? And then I heard a voice and I recognized the tone of the voice. It was my own voice. And the voice said, I am the gardener here. I know what I want you to do. And now almost 50 years later, I look up to God and say, thank you, Mr. Gardener, for cutting me down. Sometimes it's really hard when the Lord is pruning us, but when we look back with more perspective, we can see that it was for our growth. Take a moment and consider this question. What has been a specific time in your life when God has pruned you in some way? With additional perspective, how do you feel about this pruning? Let's hear from a member of our masterclass, share their perspective. The same week that I found out I got into BYU is the same week I found out that I had an autoimmune disease, my kidneys were failing, I had emergency surgery, and I was very, very sick. My dream of dancing at BYU came to an end. I could barely walk, let alone dance, for about a year after my diagnosis. This was a huge loss for me. I was very depressed and sad and grieved the loss of dance in my life. While I was able to continue to dance thereafter, it wasn't the same. I wasn't in the best shape anymore. I was weak and I was tired easily. As I continued to try to build my strength, I was so, so grateful for the many gifts that I saw in my life. Heavenly Father blessed me with the major of recreation therapy. I graduated BYU and moved to Cleveland to work in the Cleveland Clinic Children's Hospital for rehabilitation. I worked with children on dialysis. This was profound for me. I had just been diagnosed with a kidney disease and here I am working with children with kidney disease. I was able to care for them, love them, and see them in a way that maybe other staff couldn't. I had experienced very real health challenges and was able to show compassion and love. Years later, as I served as a Relief Society president, a young men's president, and many other callings, and now a mom of three, I see that this loss of dance was truly a gift, a way for God to instill in me empathy, love, and compassion to be able to serve his children in the way that he needed me to. Thank you for sharing that experience. Now, I don't want to get too quantitative here, but I think it's interesting that if we look at these different aspects of nourishing, pruning, digging, dunging, and count up how often they occur, which one do you think comes most? Nourishing appears 22 times, pruning, nine, digging, seven, and dunging those trials that really stink only three times. So I'm not sure that this is meant to be a mathematical equation, but I find it comforting that nourishing is mentioned more than all of the others combined. I know that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are trying to bless us as they help us grow. Now, if we were all in a room together, about this point in the class, we'd do something that's really fun. I would have everyone stand up And I would say to them, have you got Jacob chapter 5, verses 70 through 72 marked in your scriptures? If you don't, you have to do 10 jumping jacks right now. And everyone would go and look at their scriptures, and most people don't have them marked, and so they start doing those 10 jumping jacks. Now, here's why this is a fun activity. It's because at the very start of the class, 
I'll go to a couple of students and I'll hand them a piece of paper that says anyone in class who does not have Jacob chapter 5 verses 70 through 72 marked will have to do 10 jumping jacks today. And it's always interesting to see what people do with that piece of paper. Sometimes they'll mark the verses themselves, but they won't share it with anyone else. Sometimes you'll see them just go around to a couple of their friends and tell their friends to mark the verses. And every once in a while, someone will make a diligent effort to tell everyone, hey, you've got to mark these verses. No matter what the people who receive the message from me at the beginning of class do, it's always a great object lesson to talk about, did you share what you know with others? Sometimes people will say, well, I, I thought the message was just for me, or I didn't want to be disruptive. I, I wasn't sure what people would say if I went and talked to them. And it's great for us to say, all right, how does that relate to sharing the gospel? Because that's really what verses 70 through 72, those verses that hopefully we all have marked in our scriptures, are about. Let's read them. Jacob says, the servant brought other servants, and they were few. So as the final gathering begins, the servant of the Lord of the vineyard, and we might see that as the prophet, is gathering other servants, you and me, to help in the gathering. But these servants are few in number. More are needed. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto them, If ye labor with your might with me, ye shall have joy in the fruit. And I love to think about those phrases, labor with your might and have joy. It's not that we're just out there gritting our teeth trying to get things done. It is a joyful process of talking to others about the joy we feel in our lives from Jesus Christ and helping them gather to him. We read, the servants did go and labor with their mites, and the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them. I love that phrase. Whether you're preparing for full-time missionary service or simply trying to share the gospel as part of normal, everyday life, I love knowing that Jesus Christ is laboring with those who are making efforts to gather souls to him. As we turn to Jacob chapter 6, let's look at an interesting way that Jacob frames his book. Back in Jacob chapter 1, verse 7, Jacob tells us, We labor diligently among our people to persuade them to come unto Christ, that they might enter into his rest, lest by any means he should swear in his wrath that they should not enter, as in the provocation in the days of temptation, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness. Many of us might not be familiar with Psalm 95, but it's clear that Jacob is alluding to this psalm. Psalm 95 says, As in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Can you see the clear connection between these verses? So up front, at the beginning of the book of Jacob, he clearly references Psalm 95. Now in Jacob 6, near the end of his record, Jacob again alludes to this psalm. Jacob 6.6 6 says, Yea, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, for why will ye die? Psalm 95, 7 and 8 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. When we look at this holistically, it seems like at some level, Jacob is structuring his book around Psalm 95. We can perhaps see a core message of today. You and I have a choice. We can come unto Christ or we can harden our hearts. If I come unto Christ, I'll find rest in the kingdom of God. But if I harden my heart, then I'll be hewn down and cast into the fire. This is another one of those little intricate details that I wouldn't base my testimony of the Book of Mormon on. But this definitely does not seem like something Joseph Smith would make up. This is Jacob, who's carefully considered Psalm 95, crafting his book around this message, the question of what will you and I do today? Now, for those of you who are wishing that you could learn more about this by reading an awesome article, that wish has already been granted. Go ahead and take a look at the course website. But for now, let's go to what might have originally been intended to be some of Jacob's very last words. In Jacob chapter 6, verse 12, he says, O oh, be wise, what can I say more? What a great phrase. If Jacob sold t-shirts, I bet he would sell one that said, Oh, be wise. What can I say more? That one might be a better seller than a t-shirt that had all of Jacob chapter five written on it. 
Take a moment and think about that phrase, oh, be wise, what can I say more? There are so many different circumstances that we're going to find ourselves in. Jacob says, look, I can't micromanage every decision that you're going to have to make. I can't tell you all of the different ways that you can sin. Just be wise. What great advice for each of us. And then Jacob says, I bid you farewell. So it sounds like this is the end. I would expect that to be where the book of Jacob comes to an end, but there's going to be some more. And as we begin Jacob chapter 7, I want to remind us of a statement from President Benson that we saw a couple of class periods ago, where President Benson said, the Book of Mormon exposes the enemies of Christ. As we read Jacob chapter 7, we're introduced to an enemy of Christ. His name is Sherem. And as we read this chapter, there's two lenses that I suggest we read it with. First, what does Sherem teach us about modern antichrists? And second, what does Jacob teach us about responding to attacks on our faith? Now, we'll explore these two questions, but first, a little joke. What did Jacob say to the Antichrist about his false teachings? Don't share them. <laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't resist that little humor there. Now, as we look at what can we learn from Sherem? If the Book of Mormon exposes the enemies of Christ, what tactics of the devil are exposed to us as we read these verses. Sherem preached many things. He labored diligently. He wanted to overthrow the doctrine of Christ. His explicit purpose was to shake people's faith. Sherem was learned. He had a perfect knowledge of the language, so he could use much flattery and much power of speech. Jacob's also going to ask for a sign. Maybe we can see in modern day Sherems, people who are so persuasive, they seem totally put together. Their words just flow. And as I'm hearing them, maybe I'm watching a video on social media and I'm like, holy cow, this person really seems to know what they're talking about. Probably they're right and I'm wrong. But note what happened at the end of Sherem's life, which I think is also something really instructive for us. Sherem spake plainly to the people that he had been deceived by the power of the devil he said, I fear lest I have committed the unpardonable sin, for I have lied unto God, for I denied the Christ and said that I believed the scriptures, and they truly testify of him. And because I have thus lied unto God, I greatly fear lest my case shall be awful. But I confess unto God. The story of Sherem reminds us that you and I are going to come across antichrists who seem really persuasive. And if we listen to them, we might even start to doubt what we believe. But know that in the long run, Sherem always finds out that he was wrong. I love what President Russell M. Nelson taught. Don't pollute your testimony with the false philosophies of unbelieving men and women and then wonder why it is waning. Please hear me when I say, do not be led astray by those whose doubts may be fueled by things you cannot see in their lives. Stop increasing your doubts by rehearsing them with other doubters. Allow the Lord to lead you on your journey of spiritual discovery. You and I are going to encounter Sherems, whether we like it or not. How do we handle this? I love reading Jacob 7 and looking for what Jacob did. We read, I, Jacob, had faith in Christ. Sherem had hoped to shake me from the faith, notwithstanding the many revelations and many things which I had seen concerning these things. For I truly had seen angels, and they had ministered unto me. And also I had heard the voice of the Lord speaking unto me in very word from time to time. Wherefore, I could not be shaken. The more we can increase our faith, in Jesus Christ and have personal experiences with Heavenly Father, the stronger will be our ability to remain unshaken when difficulties come. That's why I love so much what President Nelson taught. I plead with you to take charge of your testimony. Work for it. Own it. Care for it. Nurture it so that it will grow. Engage in daily, earnest, humble prayer. Nourish yourself in the words of ancient and modern prophets. 
Ask the Lord to teach you how to hear Him better. Spend more time in the temple and in family history work. As you make your testimony your highest priority, watch for miracles to happen in your life. This takes us back to our question, why not learn all we can about Jesus Christ and His atonement? I know that as we take charge of our testimonies, focus on Jesus Christ like we never have before, we can get to the point where we will say with Jacob, I cannot be shaken.